Welcome everybody for this very unique talk, talk by Professor Eliel Sperling, whom I very much welcome here. Uh, this time in the name of the Institute of the Study for Strategic Regions. Uh, what is this institute? You will hear more in the near future because it's just being established. Uh, the only thing I want to say that in the morning we hosted uh, Madeleine Albright uh, giving a talk in the Faculty of Arts and I have just learned that Elliot Sperling was on her team of advisors when she was Secretary of State. So we combined together <laughs> these two things by pure coincidence. Uh, anyhow, welcome very much. Thank you. And a uh, few words I have even recently uh, done. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, since recently, Tibetan history has become a topic which even uh, political representatives of our country feel necessary to comment on. And so I'm thus immensely uh, glad, pleased, that uh, I can welcome a man who spent most of his life researching primary sources concerning Tibetan history, both Tibetan and Chinese, and who does not resort to cheap and misleading propaganda. Uh, I'm glad that uh, we can listen to the talk by Elliot Sperling here, an acclaimed historian and expert on Tibetan-Chinese relations, whose lecture was jointly organized by our Department of uh, uh, South and Central Asia, Chanting World Foundation, uh, and uh, Oriental Institute of uh, Academy of Sciences. Uh, please tell you the floor is yours. Well, uh, thank you very much. And uh, I would like to thank Dr. Olga Lomovo for uh, coming here today uh, from the uh, Institute for Far Eastern Studies and the Zhang Jingguo, we now also oversee the Zhang Jingguo Foundation, uh, the branch here. And uh, Dr. Daniel Barunsky, of course, an old friend and colleague in Tibetan studies. It's really, really a, a, a great pleasure. And as Daniel said, I will not give you cheap and misleading propaganda. I will give you expensive and misleading propaganda. Uh, <laughs> So uh, it's also uh, a real pleasure for me to be here because, well, well for a number of reasons. One, uh, I've never been in Prague before. This is the first time I've been in Prague. And of course, like all first-time visitors, I'm absolutely dazzled. You know, such a wonderful place. And uh, Prague is one of the candidates for the next uh, meeting of the International Association for Tibetan Studies uh, for, to host it. And uh, I, I dearly hope... Uh, um, that Prague will uh, be the site. Uh, not least of all because as those in Tibetan studies know who spend time in Tibet, um, given a choice between wine and beer, the Tibetan will always take beer. And uh, uh, if there's one thing which is in ample supply and uh, both good and not expensive, uh, it's beer here. Um, I'm also very uh, honored to be here because one of the first people who really worked in the area of Sino-Tibetan relations using uh, original sources uh, was Professor uh, Dr. Yosef Kolmash, um, whose presence here, of course, uh, is very well known, I assume. And when I first began, many of his uh, writings were very crucial uh, to some of the things that I was looking at. Uh, uh, he translated large sections of the Qing Shi Gao, the uh, draft history of the Qing dynasty, completed just after the dynasty uh, had ended, large sections dealing with Tibet. And so he was a real pioneer. Uh, back in those days, most of the work that was being done with regard to Tibet or Tibetan studies was uh, Buddhology. It was largely related to uh, Buddhism and Buddhist doctrine. Uh, the use of Tibetan to understand Sanskrit uh, uh, materials. And those of us who were working in history were a very, very small little band. And uh, um, the work of uh, uh, Professor Dr. Komash was very, very important to us. So this is uh, really an honor for me to be here. And uh, uh, I want to thank you, especially Daniel, for the uh, invitation. Daniel knew that I was... Uh, uh, in Vienna, so he said it's very, very close, and indeed it is very close. 
Uh, I, did, I, I went to Warsaw for a conference, and that was an overnight trip on the train, but very pleasant. And this was just a few hours and uh, direct, and uh, here you are. So uh, thank you all very much, and thank you for coming. I, I assume some of you were at the uh, uh, talk by Madeleine Albright this morning, so you must be exhausted. And uh, uh, I will try not to put you to sleep. Uh, you know, I, I do have the habit, or I have the reputation, for when I am at a conference and I'm giving a paper and it must be within 20 minutes and I have, I don't know how many pages, I start reading very quickly and nobody can understand what I'm saying. Uh, but academics are always very embarrassed to admit that they didn't understand anything. So I wind up with a reputation for you know, being very erudite when nobody understands really what I've said. I won't do that today. Um, I am, I'm a native New Yorker, so I do tend to speak quickly. Um, but I would like this to be much more informal. So you know, please don't hesitate to either say or to give me a sign to slow down, slow down. Um, okay, and I apologize also, I'm speaking in English. I don't have Madeleine Albright's command of Czech. So uh, uh, even though I did, um, uh, uh, um, I did work on a, an advisory committee to the State Department, I was not uh, a government worker or a member of uh, the administration. This was an outside advisory committee. Uh, so you'll judge the quality of the advice she got uh, by the lecture today. Okay, um, what I'm, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's funny to say that uh, uh, um, we often think about Tibet as really having, or Tibetan history as being completely internalized, localized, the image of Tibet being cut off from the rest of the world, um, it's, it's almost ironic because so much of uh, Tibetan literature, uh, particularly Buddhist literature, emphasizes the connection to India. Uh, and this should make it very clear at the outset that uh, indeed, you know, there is Tibetan history, you know, uh, uh, inside and outside China and inside and outside Tibet. And I'm going to look at some issues here. I've just picked up a couple of issues of things which I've looked at over the years. And I think these would be appropriate to discuss. And these uh, include the question of the name of Tibet, when Tibet became a part of China, uh, Tibet's place within the greater world around it in the 18th century, and finally the question of Tibetan backwardness. I hope I'll be able to get to all of these. If it's, uh, if it's 9 o'clock at night and I'm still going on, uh, then maybe I uh, uh, haven't gotten to everything. But uh, uh, So uh, let me just start here. Ippolito um, Desideri, the uh, Jesuit missionary uh, who went to Tibet in the early 18th century, left a wonderful record, uh, a record which, by the way, was unfortunately uh, uh, hidden away in his uh, uh, parish in Italy and didn't come to light until the second half of the 19th century. Had it uh, been known earlier, it would have saved us many, 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 many decades, at least a century and a half, of basically answering the same questions which he had already answered in his Relatio. Um, he notes there, one of the surprising things for him was that nobody in Tibet knows the name Tibet. And he found this absolutely surprising, that uh, if you say Tibet, nobody knows what you're talking about. And he uh, noted that the name that uh, the people inside the country use is Pe, uh, uh, spelled, well, it's uh, Romanized B-O-D. And he left this nice little bit, a nice little bit of linguistic information, which is still valid today. That uh, he he writes, quote unquote, it's like the French word for uh, a little bit of something, un peu, uh, and it's still valid. It's uh, uh, you know, it's uh, 300 years later. We're you know, we're still there. But um, it's quite interesting that he uh, noted that the name of Tibet was unknown in Tibet because there's a whole history to that. Uh, uh, name. Now we know that in the Tang period, in the Tang period, uh, the name was uh, Tufan, which I have up there. Now, some of you who know Chinese, I, I don't know, there, are there any, any people who are working in Chinese study? Yeah. Um, you're probably thinking that I'm mispronouncing that, that everybody knows it should be Tubo. 
Um, but in point of fact, it's not. And this is something that I'm going to get into, uh, where the name, of, the name Tibet comes from. Because actually, uh, this is a miswriting of what was uh, ultimately, what was originally the name Tibet. And it was miswritten. Um, that this character, the second character, is pronounced Fan and not Bo. You might think that this is really some dull, useless bit of uh, 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 historical linguistic information of interest only to linguists. And in a sense, maybe, you know, it, it should be. The second character uh, has elements in it that are in other characters pronounced Bo and Po, but we know and this has been pointed out by Paul Pelio, we know that it was pronounced during the Tang period something akin to pan. In other words, what is now a f was a p uh, during the Tang period. And there are all of these different rhyming dictionaries, Chinese rhyming dictionaries, which allow us to reconstruct uh, uh, the pronunciation. But because part of the character looks similar to others that are pronounced bo or po, the thinking uh, began in the late 19th, actually, no, in the middle of the 19th century. Ab Abul Remusat uh, and later on uh, William Woodville Rockhill uh, decided, ah, this must be pronounced uh, Bo, and this must actually include the name for Tibet, Pe. And that sounds very, very simple. The only problem is that, well, first of all, uh, during the Qing period, the 19th century, it was pronounced Fan. And even, you know, uh, without uh, uh, giving away the dates, when I was a young student, and I was studying in Taiwan, actually, back then, uh, if one wanted to spend time working on one's Chinese, uh, as an American, one could not really go to Beijing, so you went to Taipei. And in reading things with some of my teachers there, it was always pronounced fan. It's now pronounced bo in the People's Republic of China, and if I may say so, this is politicized language or politicized linguistics. The idea behind it is to assert that in point of fact during the Tang period the relationship with Tibet was so close that they knew that it was that the name of Tibet was Pe and therefore they had this name which is uh, Tubo. Um, and you'll see things transcribed into English using the pinyin system. Uh, sometimes there are books, you know, the Tubo Kingdom, the Tubo this, blah, 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 blah. And I've you know, always said this is a complete error. And not only is it a complete error, it's a politicized error. Um, now, it's, it, you know, uh, I, um, what I'm saying to you is uh, not something which displays my own linguistic brilliance. I'm not a linguist, I'm a, um, an historian, but of course we have to use linguistic tools if you're doing philology. This is something that was pointed out in 1915 by Paul Pelio. He wrote in an article in Journal Asiatique because it was Western Sinologists who were saying, ah, this must, must be something that was pronounced Bo. And he wrote a critique and he said, you go through all the dictionaries and you cannot find this as a Bo. It was Pan or Tu Fan. And not only that, then you have the other question of what do you do if this, is, if this Bo is meant to be Pe? And uh, for, for you students here, this is a little, uh, uh, how shall I say, a, a little comment on methodology. You know, what do you do then? Unfortunately, the advocates of Bo then said, okay, what do we do with this too? Because the Tibetans don't, you know, they, they say pe, they don't, they don't say anything else. So what the advocates would do is they'd look through a dictionary to try and find something that sounds like two that they could put in front of it. So you, they found tope and Tepe, uh, uh, Upper Tibet, High Tibet, and they decided that oh, this is what it must be. This is what the name must be. The only problem with that, well, I shouldn't say the only, I said, uh, the, you know, one of the big problems is it's unattested. We have all of these documents from Dunhua, and we have concordances to these documents. And if you look, you won't find Tepe or Tepe. Uh, a sinologist whom I know, uh, who's a, I, 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 let me just say he's an enthusiastic proponent of the uh, uh, Tubo uh, uh, pronunciation, insisted to me that he had seen it somewhere. And he's not a Tibetanist, but he said he'd seen it somewhere. And uh, I said, if you can show it to me, 
I will reconsider. If it's attested, I would reconsider. But uh, um, there's a, a, another problem with that. And uh, yeah, I, I, I think I, if I, I, I guess I should move on. I said I'm going to be conversational, but when I'm conversational, I just go all over the place. I, I digress, which is uh, uh, something my students use against me. Uh, they try to get me to speak off the topic so that I don't cover the day's lesson. Um, <laughs> Or they used to until I retired. Um, but uh, there's a, you know, there, 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 you know, you have this big problem that it's unattested. The other thing is that the name actually comes much earlier. Let me, yeah. Um, the fact is that you had a number of different peoples on the Tibetan plateau who did not call themselves Pe in the earliest uh, uh, period. The earliest period, actually, the area of the great emperors who ultimately ruled a massive empire during the period from the mid-7th to the uh, mid-9th century, they came from the south-central part of the Tibetan plateau. And as I often say to my students, think of the Tibetan people the way you would think of the Arab people in terms of formation. That is to say, we know that with the Arabs, you have a very dynamic group that explodes out of one portion of the Arabian Peninsula when the smoke and dust clears from the Atlantic Ocean to the Tigris and Euphrates, everybody's an Arab. In other words, the people are assimilated and you wind up with the creation. There is a flux here, there's a process, the creation of the Arabs as a people. Now, thanks to classical historians, we have an idea of other peoples who were in this area prior to becoming, if you will, uh, Arabicized. With the Tibetan plateau, we have a very similar process, the formation of the Tibetan em Empire, so that there's a dynamic group in the south-central portion of the plateau. This is Per, and they explode out of that area, and they overrun the plateau, spill over it into, into areas in Central Asia, they uh, control areas in China proper, very close to the uh, capital of the Tang Dynasty. But when the smoke and dust clears, and I say this, I'm, I'm exaggerating when I say this, and I'm also being very melodramatic, so uh, uh, appreciate the tone. When the smoke and dust clears from the borders of Kashmir in the west to the shores of Lake Kokonor in the east, everybody is the descendant of a monkey bodhisattva and a rock ogress. Now, uh, in a sense, I'm not, I'm not trying to argue for uh, nationalism, uh, but what I am doing is arguing for uh, the idea of an ethne. That is to say, one of the common uh, characteristics, everybody has different uh, 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 theories on nationalism, and one theoretician named Walker Connor posited that one of the uh, 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 important elements is the perception of common kinship. The reality of common kinship, of course, would be ridiculous, but it's the perception. And the idea that all of these people, in some ways, with, with exceptions, there are exceptions in there, of course, but the idea of descent from a monkey bodhisattva and a rock ogress is something which makes the Tibetans, if you will, a people. Here I have uh, 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 some of the, uh, the names of some of the people who were on the Tibetan plateau. But to get back to uh, the whole idea of Tufan and Tubo, um, the Jiu Tang Shu, the uh, uh, old uh, Tang annals, if you will. Uh, one of the, there are two official dynastic histories of the Tang, an old one and a new one. There are, uh, it was rewritten. But we basically learn from them, we basically learn from them that the area, and when they're talking about the area, you have to understand they are talking about the area closest to China proper, which in this period, you know, with the capital in the north, would be the area of Amdo, uh, modern Qinghai, Gansu, the Tibetan plateau, the northeastern portion of the Tibetan plateau. And they note uh, the presence of a uh, Xianbei clan that gives its name to the area. And the name of the Xianbei clan is Tufa, which, what, how would that be pronounced? That's the interesting thing. It's a clan name. And uh, those of you who might know something about Cantonese or even some Japanese pronunciations of Chinese characters know that often what in Mandarin uh, uh, you know, uh, does not have a final, has no final consonant, often in the Tang period did have a final consonant. This in the Tang period, Tufa, this clan name would have been Tu Pat, Tu Pat. 
And essentially, it's a clan name that, if you want, is Tibet. Now, my, my uh, friend, who the sinologist who advocates the Tubor uh, 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 hypothesis, says, "Well, this is you know this is ridiculous. You're saying that you know this name that moves you know all, you know uh, all over the place, and that uh, uh, it has nothing to do with Tubor, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. And in point of fact, names migrate. Names do migrate. Let me give you a, a you know a very easy example. Um, in the Americas, north and south, none of the indigenous people knew that they were Americans. But somehow that name moved there. And it's a personal name, you know, not a clan name. It was a personal name, but still, you know, you have that, uh, that there. Names move. You know, not everything is logical. I used to work at Indiana University. If there were a major cataclysm, you know, asteroid hits the American Midwest, and nobody goes to do any uh, archaeological work to try and find out what life was like there for, uh, I don't know, 3,000 years. They eventually dig up the seal of the university. They would, of course, have to assume that the language of instruction was Sanskrit. This is Indiana University. Um, so we, we, we really should stop being precious about uh, uh, the movement of names. But here's the interesting thing. In the Tang histories, we get, and this is the final sentence at the bottom, that uh, the name of the country, and this is about Tibet, the name of the country was Tufa, but we miswrote it and called it Tufan. So this whole business of Tufan having to be poor, it's based upon a mistake. And it's noted as being a mistake in the dynastic histories that actually the real name is Tufa. Now, this comes from the name, again, of a Xianbei clan prior to the Tang period, and it becomes Tupat. And the interesting thing is it then goes to the Turks, who write Tupat, and the Turks give it to the Arabs, Tibet, and it eventually comes to Europe as Tibet. And in fact, it goes all over the place. The interesting thing is that the areas closest to China did not use Bo or Pe. They, and, well, and why should they? Because there was no Pe there. Uh, and Pe you know, was, again, you know, in South Central Tibet, and as I sometimes say, you know, the idea that they would have called themselves Topa or Tupa, you know, High Tibet, Upper Tibet, or whatever, um, is rather curious because if you're living there, you might not know that you were high up. You're just living there. You go maybe 50 to 100 miles from where you're living. You don't know that you're so high up. Um, this is very much of a, a kind of a construction from, uh, from outside. And also, it was very localized in the south central portion of the plateau. We do find the name popping up in India. There is a mention of it, I believe, in the Rig Veda as Bota. Bota. Uh, but, but that's it. It was far, far, far removed from the areas that China was interacting with. And China's interaction with Tibet was really not the most knowledgeable. That is to say, uh, during the Sui Dynasty, late 6th, early 7th century, uh, during the Sui Dynasty, there were missions from Tibet, uh, about two of them, and they were written as coming from a place called Fu Guo. And it was R.A. Stein in France who, who discovered what Fu Guo was, that that Fu Guo actually meant Pujian the land of the Tibetan emperor. One of the names by which the Tibetan emperor was known was Pugyel. But when the Tang dynasty, which succeeds, begins to deal with the same area, they use the term Tufan, and there is no indication whatsoever. This is why the problem existed. No indication that they had any idea that it had any connection to the previous Fu Guo that had come to uh, uh, China. And that's because there were so many different peoples in the area between Tibet and China. Uh, before the Tibetan Empire ult ultimately expanded itself so that it was uh, uh, bordering uh, China and having uh, conflicts with China. Okay, so, uh, um, okay, so um, I'm going to leave that question there. Um, I'm sure you're all satisfied now, you know, as uh, the Tibetan, uh, you know, uh, text, uh, text say, you know, a feast that will satisfy uh, uh, all the scholars. Uh, Okay, so the uh, next, oh yeah, uh, ah yes, the next uh, 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 thing that I want to talk about is the question of when Tibet became a part of China. Now, this is, of course, one of the more contentious questions. 
the general position has been in China that Tibet became a part of China during the Yuan Dynasty. That is to say, during the period of the Mongol Empire, that the Mongols made Tibet a part of China. And that would be in the 13th century. Now, there's a problem with that. There's a problem with that. Uh, uh, and the problem is that there's no record of Tibet becoming a part of China. Uh, we know that Tibet was a part of the Mongol Empire. We know that the Mongols dominated Tibet, but there's no indication that Tibet uh, uh, was taken by the Mongols and attached to China. It was ruled, it was ruled by Hublai, Kublai Khan. Well, I, I, don't, I don't know what the Czech pronunciation would be. Is it Hublai? Kublai. Kublai. Yeah, Kublai. Yeah, the good, good old Marco Polo uh, pronunciation. <laughs> you know, I never, I never know. I always think, you know, I, I generally tend to say Hubilai, which is the Mongolian pronunciation, but, uh, you know, we're very strict about that, you know, in our department of, inter you know, in our inter Asian studies uh, 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 area. Um, uh, you know, Hubilai did dominate Tibet. He was the Mongol who ruled Tibet, but Hubilai's claim was to the entire Mongol Empire. And Tibet essentially was a part of it. There's no, um, as I say, there's, uh, uh, in, in the uh, official dynastic history for the Yuan, which the Ming Dynasty wrote, there is uh, no chapter on Tibet within the administrative geography. Uh, one of the things, if, if you're reading uh, classical Chinese historical sources, you'll know that the dynastic histories have a very common structure. First, they have a, you know, the first part, the first several chapters is a chronology, year to year, and within the years, month and sometimes days of what happened during the reign of all of the emperors. Then uh, you have uh, geographical chapters, which give you uh, 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 the, the administrative geography. In other words, what the, uh, what the provinces were, what the prefectures were, the capitals of each, uh, um, then sub-prefectural level sometimes you'll get all of these different things. Then you'll have a chapter on economics. It, it, it sometimes varies, but then of course you'll get biographies and monographs and monographs on uh, foreign countries. Um, the problem with Tibet is it is not included in the administrative geography of the dynasty. Now, uh, I was challenged on that once at a uh, um, uh, there was a, uh, um, uh, uh, in 2008, as some of you may know, there was extensive protesting across Tibet, and it even threatened uh, uh, the harmony of the Olympic Games, which were going to be held in Beijing. And uh, we had, you know, at my university, we had a number of meetings to discuss this. And one of the meetings was hosted by the uh, Beijing University Alumni Association. That is, the students who were graduates of Beijing University and now studying at Indiana University. So they, they invited me to come, and I gave them my, as, as I said, my uh, uh, expensive and misleading propaganda, my most expensive. And in talking about this, of course, now everybody has uh, computers, and it's very easy to uh, do a word search within the dynastic histories. You get their, their sites. And so somebody said to me, yes, I found Tibet in the UN, in the UN uh, history. And I had to say, yes, it's in the UN history. It's mentioned in the UN history, but not as a part of the administrative geography of the empire. So um, there are problems with that. And the fact that uh, uh, 20th century um, writers in the People's Republic of China have made this assertion often brings uh, 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 some very, very, very uh, uh, interesting elements into play. That is to say that they say it became a part of China during Yuan Dynasty, but they give completely different dates. Bec and the reason is because there is no actual proclamation or statement or anything like that. So they just say, well, uh, um, when uh, Sakya Pandita uh, uh, submitted to uh, Guden, um, then Tibet became a, a, a part of China, or when the Yuan Dynasty was established, which was many decades later, then Tibet became a part of China, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There's, there's no, uh, uh, no source that one could uh, back up with that. But the interesting thing is that this, of course, was known prior to this time, prior to the people's, it's not just prior to the People's Republic of China, it's prior really to the early 1960s that the idea was not that Tibet became a part of China during the UN period, but that it became a part of China during the Qing period. This is what Chinese writers write. Now, that is also problematic, and I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. Um, uh, 
Uh, are you following me? Am I going too fast? Uh, am I, you know, I mean, I always feel you know, a little trepidation, nervousness when I'm speaking to uh, uh, you know, a group of scholars who are not necessarily native speakers of English because things that I think, you know, that just trip off my tongue, you know, maybe, uh, uh, how should I say, a bit slang or something, I don't know, or jargony, academic jargony, which I, you know, I, I must say, I, you know, I'm not a fan of academic jargon. But um, uh, in any event, it was generally during the, uh, um, uh, uh, during the Qing period that people would write that. And um, there's something interesting you know, isn't, isn't, it, isn't it odd how many times I say there's something interesting? That's to encourage you, to, to hypnotize you, to think that everything I'm saying is interesting. Um, you know, to make you think you've never heard this before. But in the Qing sources, the terms that are sometimes used for Tibet include fan shu, even fan ban. And these are essentially feudal terms, and they indicate a feudatory. Uh, a, a, uh, um, a power over which one has suzerainty, if you will, um, not an integral part of the realm. And the reason, of course, is easy to see because the Qing was an empire. In other words, it was not, as uh, people tried to project this back into the past, that it was a, a unitary multinational state. And uh, uh, that is full of all sorts of problems because the Chinese state actually was faced with uh, uh, a problem of what to do with national minorities. And you know under um, uh, Marxist-Leninist ideas, this gets to be very, 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 very touchy, um, especially if one starts with the idea, the basic, if you want to go to you know, the basic idea that uh, uh, national differences are completely superficial and uh, in point of fact, it is only the class differences that, uh, 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 that matter at all. Uh, so it really, it really is a, a, a fact that the Qing was an empire. In the Soviet Union, they had no problem distinguishing from the Tsarist Empire as, as an empire and the Soviet Union, which is a voluntary and harmonious uh, 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 union of nations. Uh, a United Nations of its own, as uh, sometimes uh, their expensive and misleading propaganda would put it. Um, but uh, in the People's Republic of China, they've gone completely backwards, and uh, they, they've, they're projecting the present onto the past and maintaining that China has always been a multinational, unitary multinational state. And so the Qing, and for those of you who, do, who uh, are unsure, the Qing is 1368, is, I'm sorry, 1644 to 1911. It is the dynasty established by the Manchus. And indeed, there is a school of thought uh, of Sinology known as New Qing Studies, which is not so new anymore. It's about 35, 40 years old at, at this point, but uh, has come under very strong attack in the People's Republic of China. So much so that uh, the order seems to have gone out to certain Chinese scholars that they must carry the struggle against New Qing studies beyond the borders to, the, uh, to foreign countries. And I've seen this at a couple of conferences where uh, scholars will all of a sudden, apropos of nothing, start denouncing New Qing studies because New Qing studies says that the Qing should be understood as a Manchu empire and that one should not simply use Chinese sources to understand the Qing, but Manchu sources as well. And that if looked at in this way, uh, Tibet, Mongolia, um, uh, what is today Xinjiang, are, are essentially components of this large Manchu empire. And of course, that now is uh, uh, absolutely being uh, 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 fought against within the People's Republic of China. But it's, it, it's very recent that, uh, as with many things with China, that they've felt the, uh, uh, secure enough to uh, be very assertive about this outside. Um, I don't think I have to say anything here about uh, uh, the policy towards the Dalai Lama and the Dalai Lama's visits uh, abroad. There was a time when um, they would be denounced, but uh, there wouldn't be very harsh repercussions or there might be a week of uh, uh, bad editorials in uh, uh, People's Daily or something. But now they're much more assertive about that, and the same thing for New Qing studies. But um, in looking at a number of uh, 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 sources, 
and this is just typical of them. Um, this, was, uh, this is a Chinese work on Tibet from 1926. So, uh, you know, in 57 to 58 years of Qianlong, 1792 and 93, uh, the relationship between China and Tibet was radically reformed. And indeed, indeed, uh, in terms of Qing domination, uh, I generally say it starts at the beginning of the 18th, or well, early in the 18th century, around 1720 or so, but it's domination, but it moves incrementally so that by the end of the 18th century, indeed, the Qing state really is dominant. Tibet is subordinate. It is a part of the Qing empire. And so 1792 and 1793, the relationship was radically reformed. There was a disastrous war with Nepal, with which the Tibetans completely botched. And the, uh, it, it resulted in a, a, a really stupendous military feat. The Qing sent an army over the Himalayas to the Kathmandu Valley. And this was quite incredible. It's also tremendously expensive. And the court was so angry with the Tibetans. And they, uh, uh, they actually then imposed all sorts of regulations, one of which, by the way, is something you may have heard of, the use of the golden urn to determine incarnations. This was one of their uh, uh, reforms. The court essentially said that the whole process of choosing the incarnation of high lamas is totally corrupt. And so they imposed this, um, which is an another issue I could talk about. But uh, uh, <laughs> you know, you know, I, I, I actually I'm, I'm supposed to give another paper at uh, uh, what 4:30 I think. Five. Oh, five. Okay. Uh, so actually, I can't go. I can't go into all, all of these little nooks and crannies of Tibetan history that I would like to. But in any event, 1926. Uh, this is the way it was understood in by historiographers in the Republic of China. Not the People's Republic, but the Republic that preceded it from 1911 to 1949. Okay, uh, um, uh, so this is, this is the way they, uh, uh, they saw it as coming from the Qing. And indeed, um, uh, the People's Republic didn't pay too much attention to the historical question. They just claimed that since Tibet belonged to the Qing, it belongs to China, period. And uh, uh, they really only, how should I say, gave the task to their historians to come up with a definite uh, 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 chronology after 1959 and the Tibetan revolt in 1959. And some of the stuff that you see right after 5960 says, oh, Tibet has been a part of China since the Tang Dynasty. And of course, you know, that's, you know, that's completely uh, 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 unsupported by any, uh, uh, in, f in fact, it's totally contradicted by the historical record. Now, uh, Tibetans have reacted to this uh, almost going in the opposite direction. Uh, both uh, uh, Tsepan Shakapa, who is a great Tibetan historian, uh, and actually, uh, this is also from uh, Dongto, which I'm going to uh, put now. They have maintained, and this has become uh, the, the uh, line, uh, the political line in Dharamsala, in exile, that um, Tibet never belonged to China. Uh, Tibet was always independent. And if you look at uh, the book, uh, The Status of Tibet by Michael Van Volt van Pag, um, who was, and I think still is, paid as a legal advisor to the uh, Tibetan exiles, he basically says the same thing. Uh, this is what Dongtok says. Uh, the country of Tibet was occupied by the Mon Mongol royal lineage for 49 years, but due to uh, Chigya Pakpa, uh, 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 no human being was, had, had, was afflicted with hardship. And via the path of Ahimsa, nonviolence and peace, uh, the three Chotka, that is the three provinces of the land of Tibet, uh, were freed from foreign oppression, and the civil and religious system existed with full independence. And this is absolutely not true either. Uh, Tibet was a part of the Mongol Empire. It was a part of the Qing Empire, the Manchu Empire as well. But the Qing also did not attach it to China. And that's why in uh, 1926, and I have other examples from the period of the Republic of China, uh, they say, well, Tibet was made a part of China in 1792, 1793. Uh, and again, you know, it's very difficult to say that. It's extremely difficult to say that because there, uh, there is no specific document, uh, document which says that Tibet 
or if I may, if I may um, put it in a very prejudicial way, uh, there's no document which says that the Tibetan portion of our, portion of our empire is hereby attached to China. Uh, the Manchu emper uh, emperors were emperors of a, not a, multi a unitary multinational state, but a multinational, and I use national in the sense of nation, uh, uh, empire, which, by the way, is also now uh, controversial. I don't know uh, if anybody uh, uh, pays attention to this. It just shows you that language and linguistics actually, uh, or I should say lexicography minimally, are important skills if you're doing research. The term for uh, a nationality uh, is mitic. And this is nationality in, uh, um, you know, uh, Nazia, you know, the, you know, the same thing that they got from the Russians and from the Japanese, actually. They got it from the Japanese. It's the same as the Chinese term, minzu, which, you know, uh, which also is used as an equivalence of Nazia, and uh, again comes from uh, Japan. And that was translated as nationality. Again, they talked about nationality policy. If you go back 20, 30 years, you'll find that English translations talk about this as nationality. Um, in the last, I'd say, one and a half to two decades, uh, it's, it's almost like uh, they, the mandating of, uh, uh, of uh, tu bo instead of tu fan. It is mandated that minzu, they haven't changed that in Chinese, and in Tibetan it's still mitig, but it's been mandated that in English, this must be translated as ethnic group or ethnicity, not nationality. Somehow, somebody said, you know, nationality is a little too close to nation or the idea of uh, uh, having national rights, and so it's now uh, uh, rendered as an a ethnic group. Um, but the, uh, um, you know, the fact of the matter, ultimately, uh, the fact of the matter is that when Tibet became a part of China uh, is something that has not been clear from time immemorial as far as Chinese historiography is concerned. Uh, yeah, uh, one, one uh, further footnote. You know, actually, I'm not really reading the paper, but it's like a security blanket. I really like to have a written text close by, so, you know, I... Um, but I'm giving you the information, that, and, and I'm giving you the information in it and a little bit more. Um, I, I've written about this, and I have a big enough ego so as to think that, oh, they, they, they read what I wrote and decided they had to change this. Um, sometime around, um, oh, I think this must, I'm just trying to think, it must be around 2009, 2010. Um, they began resurrecting an article by uh, an old Chinese historical geographer named uh, Tan Qi Xian, who is the editor of the um, um, uh, Historical Atlas of China, which is in eight volumes. And he wrote an article in which he said, what is historical China? What are the historical boundaries of China? And he said, the historical boundaries of China must be understood to be the Qing dynasty at its furthest extent. In other words, in the 18th century, before Russia began nibbling away at uh, 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 Qing territory, others began nibbling away at, at Qing territory, that is uh, China's uh, 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 boundaries uh, from uh, ancient times. Now, that, of course, you know, if you look at it uh, you know, with an objective eye, of course, it's ludicrous. Uh, the Qing, again, was a Manchu empire, and it established its uh, dominion over these areas, which were not part of historical China. But he, uh, what he, and it's very interesting the way he, he phrased it. Um, he said, I'm not saying that the Tang dynasty ruled Tibet. He said, that's not what I'm saying, because it can easily, easily be seen that the Tang did not rule Tibet. What he proposes is that China has to be viewed as fragmented, there are periods in Chinese history after the Tang, you have the five dynasties. All of these must be looked upon as just separate dynasties, if you will, within China. Uh, prior to the rise of the Yuan, you had the Jin dynasty, the Yao dynasty, you had the Tonguts, the Xia, uh, which, whether they're Chinese or not, is also problematic, but Chinese historiographers say, well, the Liao and the Jin, they have official dynastic histories, they're part of China. So therefore, if you take the borders 
of the Qing dynasty at its greatest extent, if you take those borders, then uh, uh, that is historical China uh, since ancient times. And he's really very, you know, since ancient times. And, uh, again, you know, this is, uh, uh, and I guess this is why history is important, because if you leave it alone and don't pay attention to it, it gets corrupted. It goes bad. Uh, so one always has to, uh, has to do that. Okay. Um, uh, oh, my. I'm going to uh, uh, um, go on to the next subject, okay? Um, uh, Tibet's greater place in the world. And again, I'm talking about... Uh, 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 Tibetan history inside and outside, and the fact, as I started off with, the fact that Tibet is tied to the greater world. It's not, it doesn't exist in isolation. I mean, we would love, you know, many people would love that uh, Tibet exist in isolation, um, that it uh, remain as a, uh, and again, you know, I, I'm not an advocate of this, you know, the Shangri-La view of Tibet, that uh, it was where all of the ancient wisdom of mankind was archived, um, you know, what you find in the, uh, in the film Lost Horizon. Um, if, I, if I may make, a, I make an official digression, okay? I, I'm absolutely di uh, digressing here. One of the things which I find very funny, uh, very interesting, and uh, I, I don't know if uh, post-colonialism is uh, part of the whole social science agenda, but uh, one of the things that they just absolutely love uh, inside the People's Republic of China is uh, Edward Said's Orientalism. Uh, now, in the United States, it's, it's how should I, say? I was going to say its effects, but why don't I say its pernicious effects uh, uh, are such that you cannot even use the word oriental. Uh, or ori orientalism, orientalist, you can't do that. Um, whereas I'm you know, very, uh, how should I say, gratified to find that the word is still in use in Europe. Uh, oh. Okay, there you have it. Well, the reason they love Said's book is that uh, it basically tells them that uh, any criticism and any uh, um, uh, attachment to Tibet is a form of romantic uh, Western imperialism and that any criticism of China is a result of uh, uh, colonialism. And so everything gets dismissed. It's, it's actually very, very funny. Uh, but... Uh, then, and here's the thing, oh yeah, and that romantic attachment, that romantic attachment to Tibet is classified as, you know, the Shangri-La view. They, you know, and they, they, you know, that Westerners criticize China because they need Tibet to be a Shangri-La. Uh, and so they criticize China as being bad and evil for destroying their Shangri-La, which never existed because it was a, uh, a feudal serf society, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, now, the interesting thing is there's actually a place in Yunnan which the authorities have renamed Xiangalila, Shangula. And I said to some colleagues in China, I said, you blame us, you know, for being these devotees of this Shangrilaism. And here, you know, no, no, you've actually named a place Shangrila. And the, the reason for naming it, of course, is that uh, this is this wonderful place that people all over the world have heard about, you know, where, I don't know, um, you know, in the book Lost Horizon, you never grow old. Uh, well, you grow old very slowly. Uh, uh, after 200 years, you still look like you're, you know, 21 or 22. Um, in any event, any event, end of digression. Let me get back to uh, the subject at hand. Um, one of the things which uh, it's a question which came to me and, and which I began to look at in terms of the connection of Tibet to the rest of the world, and something which I found, you know, very interesting as a topic, was. Economically, and people, you know, if, if it's rare that people talk about Tibetan history uh, relative to Tibetan Buddhism, it's even rarer that they talk about the Tibetan economy. And one of the reasons, of course, is that we don't really have very good sources. If you're studying Chinese economy in the 13th century, 14th century, 15th century, you have a lot of very good sources. For one thing, most of the uh, dynastic histories have uh, uh, chapters on economics. Whereas when you're doing Tibetan, and all Tibetologists know this, um, you often basically have to sit and read your text page by page by page. Uh, you don't have an idea of, you know, there's no specific chapter on economics or anything like that, and you're reading and reading to see what's in it. Uh, um, a great Tibetologist, Dan Martin, wrote an essay a couple of years ago called The End of Tibetology. And what he lamented was the use of electronic databases 
will make it possible just to search you know, for specific terms and names, and people will stop reading texts. Because as it is now, we actually go through the text to see what information we can get out of it. Out of it. But there isn't that much. It's very arduous. Uh, but the, the question which uh, uh, intrigued me was the way in which Tibet may or may not have been involved in the post-Columbian, that is to say, post-1492 world economy. Uh, one of the characteristics of that economy was the influx of silver from the New World. And in fact, that uh, 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 the figures are uh, absolutely astounding in terms of the amount of uh, uh, silver that uh, comes to China. You know, uh, the Spanish, of course, discovered uh, 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 tremendous silver reserves, silver mines that were being worked before the Europeans arrived in the New World in Peru, in Mexico. And in very short order, they took, they took these over and they began to extract enormous amounts of silver, which had a tremendous effect on the world economy. And when the Spanish established themselves in the Philippines, which again is not long after 1492, in the 16th century, they established themselves in uh, the Philippines. Uh, well, just to give you an idea, um, they began minting coins in the Americas in 1535. In 1565, they were in full occupation of, of uh, Manila. And they were able, from there, to begin trading with Asia using New World silver. And a tremendous amount of that, in fact, a majority of that, uh, of that silver, went to China. Uh, the period from 1550 to 1650 is sometimes referred to as China's uh, uh, silver century. Uh, and from there, of course, it moves elsewhere as well. It takes much longer for that silver to make it to India because most of the silver that comes from the New World to India goes to Europe first. And then it's involved in trade with the Ottoman Empire and with Persia. You have to remember that you know, this is a world unto its own, the Ottomans, the, you know, the uh, Safavids, and the uh, uh, Mughals. And so that really is uh, largely from uh, Europe that you have that. Um, I'm not saying there was no silver in China before the 16th century, far from it. But the amount that came in from the Americas really did uh, uh, change things. Now, um, there is a, how, wait, actually, how much time do I have? I shouldn't ask you, I should ask the victims, you know, actually. Um, um, uh, we, have, we have a collection of Ming statues. And these Ming statues, this is the Ming Dynasty, 1368 to 1644. These Ming statues, in one of their sections, give uh, uh, the details, the prescriptions for what is to be given to tribute missions from Tibet. When Tibetans come and they offer gifts at court, what are they to get in return? And this is what we find. Oh, it, uh, it, monastic robes and hats should be on one line. Uh, but other than that, uh, it's OK. There is gold leaf, but there's no silver. It's very, very interesting that there's no silver. So I began to, now these statutes, the uh, versions we have, uh, the latest revision was in 1587 of these statutes. So in many ways, this is really uh, 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 at the beginning. And uh, in the, at the beginning of the silver century, and as I say, it's significant that there's no silver. But then I went through, and I'm not going to give you all of, you know, all of the data here, but I went through the, uh, 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 the veritable records for the Ming Dynasty, uh, the Ming Shilu. Um, in fact, uh, I was able to do it very easily. There's a very nice uh, two-volume uh, compendium of all Tibetan references. Uh, Ming Shulu Zanzu Shiliao, extremely useful. But you have to go page by page by page, you know, because it, there's no list of, uh, there's, no, uh, there's an index, but it's a very basic index and it doesn't list silver. Look, you know, from here or there. And I went through, and essentially, of the 54 uh, recorded instances of recipro reciprocal presentations made to Tibetan hierarchs from the Ming court. And that's not all of them. Again, this is, uh, I, I, I'll tell you, um, you know, there are a lot of uh, uh, caveats uh, involved 
in this sort of a, a statement or trying to come to conclusions from this. But of the 54 recorded uh, um, uh, instances of reciprocal presentations made to Tibetans, fully 22 involve silver. So it's not quite half, but it's a, a good number. And when you look at the fact that silver wasn't supposed to be uh, presented to them according to the prescriptions in the Ming statutes, very interesting. Ming silver, a new world silver, makes its way into Tibet. And then, again, anecdotally, and I have to say anecdotally because we don't have prescriptions. You sort of look through uh, uh, the biographies of various Tibetan hierarchs who were in touch with the court, uh, and you do find references, uh, 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 references to silver. So much so that even uh, the king of Jansatam, uh, this is the uh, 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 Lijiang, the, uh, uh, the area around you know, what is now the area of the Nashi people uh, in Yunnan. The petty king there, well, actually I'm, I'm prejudicing my comments by saying a petty king, I, but the, lo the local king there, is bestowing silver on uh, hierarchs, you know, in the 17th century, and this again, you know, is anecdotal, but it seems to indicate that silver was coming into Tibet from Mexico, from Peru. Uh, Tibet is not that isolated. Um, now, I, I, okay, let me. Uh, this brings me to, uh, I guess, the very last uh, section that I want to talk about. Uh, and I'll try and be, uh, I'll try to be brief, emphasis on try, uh, to be brief here. Um, and that is Tibet's place in the world. And I'm going to combine that with the question of, you know, was Tibet backward? Um, essentially, as I said, uh, Tibet becomes, um, uh, uh, it, it is assimilated into the Qing Empire. It does become one of the Qing uh, dominions. But it does so because Tibet essentially is part of the Mongol and then Mongol Manchu or Manchu Mongol world order. Um, the Manchus, before they uh, uh, really had the Qing dynasty, were well on their way to becoming the dominant power among the Mongols. Now, as uh, um, I'm sure you all know, the Manchus are classified as quote unquote, an Altaic people. Mongol is also considered an Altaic language. I'm not going to discuss the Altaic theory here because that's uh, a controversial in its own way. But uh, uh, there are a lot of uh, commonalities there. The Manchu script is written with the Mongol script, which the Mongols got from the Uyghurs, which actually came from the shores of the Mediterranean. But that's another question. Uh, or that's another story, I should say. Uh, uh, the Tibetans uh, were, in many ways, uh, part of this Mongol world order. Um, I say from the mid 17th to the mid 18th century, I, I would say you even had a Khanate of Tibet. That is to say, Tibet was ruled by Mongols. Uh, I mean, this is uh, what I have here. This is a quote from uh, Doring Pandita. Uh, actually, his story is very interesting. I've written about, uh, about him. He's one of the, uh, the, the primary Tibetans who screwed up, who botched the war with Nepal, and he was summoned to court to answer for that. And I don't mean the court in Lhasa. He was summoned to Beijing, and he was very, very scared. And he has a, he has a whole autobiographical record of everything that happened, and it's absolutely fascinating. Um, and, in fact, it... Uh, it's interesting in a number of ways. Uh, he goes, this is after 1793, I think 1794 he's there. He goes out on the streets and he says people gawked because they had never seen a Tibetan who was not a monk. In other words, all that they saw in Beijing were Tibetan monks. They never saw a late Tibetan. And so when, he's, uh, when he goes to the office uh, to begin the preliminary interrogation, one of the things they say is, wh you know, what's this business with two earrings? Uh, um, and uh, um, uh, two different earrings on the left and right. And so uh, he answered saying that, you know, we wear a turquoise because that's the old Tibetan custom. And a pearl is the custom that spread when the Mongol kings, he said the royal lineage of the Khokhonor, Gushri Khan, were kings of Tibet. And the Tibetans really did, they really were subject to these uh, Hoshot uh, Khokhonor Mongols. And it goes even more than that. It's even deeper than that. This, this particular official, 
had never been in Mongolia. He, he served on the, on the borders uh, in Nepal, and then he went from Tibet to Beijing. And he went via Chengdu, and then up to Xi'an. He describes the route that he took. He didn't go through Mongolia. Uh, and he arrives at the court, and the emperor says to him, uh, OK, can you, uh, the, he meets the Qianlong emperor, who's very old at the time, and Qianlong says, can you speak Chinese? Can you speak Mongol? Because he wants to have a conversation with him. And of course, Qianlong spoke Mongol. Um, and uh, Doreen Pandita, the official in question, says, well, it, it's nice the way he puts it. He says, I know some nouns in Chinese, but I don't know how they fit together. <laughs> uh, which really means, you know, I just know, I know a few words. And, uh, uh, but then he says, my Mongol is shallow. Now that's humilific. What he meant is that, yes, I can speak Mongol, but it's such poor Mongol, but I can speak Mongol. And that's how it's understood. And then they commence a conversation in Mongol. And he even has a, you know, a few of the phrases from the conversation written in Mongol using Tibetan script. Um, this is somebody, this is already, I, I said the, uh, uh, um, the Mongol century, uh, the second Mongol century. The first Mongol, I'm using century a lot. The first Mongol century, of, of course, is the period of the great Mongol Empire. The second, Tibet's second Mongol century is really from the time that the Khokhonor uh, Mongols uh, installed the fifth Dalai Lama in Tibet until the first half of the 18th century uh, uh, when uh, the Khosha, the Khokhonor Mongols are defeated and the Jungar Mongols are then driven out of Tibet. But the effects of that remain. This is the end of the 18th century. Doring Pantaj has never been to, uh, 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 to Mongolia, but he's fully capable, fully capable of having a Mongol conversation with the Qianlong Emperor. And uh, I'm not going to, uh, um, well, yeah, OK, let me just uh, put this up as well. This is from another biography, uh, biography of Polane, who essentially was the most important man in Tibet from around 1720 until his death in 1747. And this was really, in many ways, the high point of uh, Tibet uh, prior to the, uh, uh, the assertion of, uh, uh, of Manchu domination, the real exertion of Manchu domination. And he and his family served with the Khoshot Mongols. And there were a lot of them. Essentially, what you had was, uh, I mean, some, sometimes people try and describe this is, this is the, the general description you get of this period, that the Khoshot Mongols came in, put the fifth Dalai Lama on the throne of Tibet, and said, oh, you're so wonderful, you're a bodhisattva, we don't want, any, we don't want to interfere with anything, so we're just going to go nomadize somewhere else, and, uh, and that's, if you need some help, maybe we'll come and help you. Um, but in point of fact, and, and this basically writes the Mongols out, uh, in point of fact, the Mongols, like the British in India, were not so numerous as to have no need of the Tibetans. And their forces were combined Tibeto-Mongol forces. And here he's describing the Tibetan forces and the Mongols going out and basically, um, how shall I say, practicing war games. Now, war games in the 18th century in Inner Asia and East Asia were, were basically Batu hunting, uh, you know, all sorts of uh, games in which you really hone your skills as warriors. And the interesting thing, he says, sometimes uh, they would actually compete. The Mongols would compete with the Tibetans. But these were joint Tibeto-Mongol forces. The Mongols were very, very integrated. Um, I'm sure some of you know that there are uh, quite a number of loan words in Tibetan uh, from Mongol. And these loan words really come from this period. You know, people who don't know too much, they say, oh, yes, it comes from the time of, you know, Chinggis and Hubalai and, uh, you know, the great Yuan dynasty. But no, it really, they really come from this period. And the Mongol influence is really there in central Tibet. So just to give you an idea, I mean, in Amdo, people for a doctor, they'll say memba, you know, common word memba for doctor. But emchi in central Tibet and in Lhasa, that's the common word, which you know is a Mongol word, and there are a number of other instances uh, 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 that exist here. Uh, let me see. Da, da, da. Oh, okay, uh, okay. That's the last one that uh, 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 the last slide that I have with that. There's one other thing which I wanted. Uh, uh, yeah, one other very very quick. Uh, ooh, uh, quick issue which I'll get to. Uh, 
You sure it's not 4.30 if I have to be there? Oh, okay. No, I, just, I don't want, you know, I don't want, don't want to be rude, you know? Um, and this is the issue of Tibetan backwardness. And this I tie to the fact that Tibet was not isolated. Um, you know, there's this theory called the Great Divergence, which people argue over, as to where was East Asia as compared to Europe, say, in the 17th and 18th century. In other words, when did the level of development diverge so much that by the 19th century, people looked at, at uh, China as being so backward and benighted, whereas previously, in terms of economy, the Qing dynasty as its, at its height was indeed very wealthy. It was not this poor place that people imagined. So, um, there are all of these different theories as to when did this happen, how did it happen. But Tibet was very much integrated into this Mongol Manchu world. And in that sense, uh, there are some indications, I would say indications, because this is, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, how should I say? It's something which is very, very hypothetical. Indications that Tibet was not uh, incapable, perhaps, of a kind of modernity. And, of course, there are questions as to, you know, what do we mean by modernity? There's all sorts of theories about modernity. Um, you know, does this mean simply technological development, economic development? Uh, you know, there's a kind of mentality of modernity, uh, the individual and all of that. And, you know, do we see any of this in Tibet? Now, uh, the fact of the matter is that we see what I call, uh, I guess, you know, if, if, if you know your Chinese Marxism, you know that the uh, um, anomalies in history uh, are, uh, are sometimes explained by these cute little terms. Um, and if any, does anybody know the term Zibanjui de Mengya? The sprouts of capitalism. Uh, whenever anybody looks at the, uh, uh, the teleology of what, you know, what the capitalist period is, you know, the feudal period, the capitalist period, socialist period, and since there are all sorts of anomalies, history doesn't lend itself to such a wonderful, easy scheme. Since you have all these anomalies, uh, historians uh, within China uh, uh, took to saying, oh, well, these are sprouts of capitalism. You know, it's uh, proto-capitalism. Not happening, but it's, it's almost there. I tend to see a lot of these things of, uh, as sprouts of modernity. Uh, I don't know. Uh, it's a neologism on my part. But um, during the 18th century, when Tibet is part of this Manchu Mongol world order. This is a time when you have uh, Jesuit science at, well, at the court in India and at the Mughal court and also at the court in Beijing. You have Russians coming into the area of uh, southern Siberia, where you have the Manchus, where you have the Mongols. The British are encroaching ever more in India. And you have trade with these areas. And it does not go unremarked. Um, George Bogle, who went to Tibet in the 1770s, notes the uh, uh, presence of Russian goods, of French cloth, and I think even uh, uh, Dutch spyglass. Uh, uh, I mean, all, all sorts of things which he finds there, which, again, are in, uh, indicative of Tibet being part of a world, of, this, uh, uh, of the larger world. And you have elements of modernity which are also visible in China, uh, in China under the Qing. And this has been talked about uh, uh, quite a bit. Um, now, one of the things which I find interesting is that you have, and here we get into the, the mentality of modernity. And, you know, people uh, uh, have taken issue with me on this. But uh, since you're all so polite, I know none of you will take issue with me on this. But... Um, uh, Polanyi, the one who wrote this uh, biography that I'm talking about, he was the most powerful person in Tibet. He really ruled Tibet from, say, 1720 to 1747. He ruled Tibet right in the middle of the regime, the government of the Dalai Lamas. Again, the very simplistic uh, way of looking at this is saying in 1642, Gushri Khan installed the fifth Dalai Lama uh, uh, in the Potala, and from there on in, 
Tibet was run by the Dalai Lamas. Well, not only did Polanyi uh, uh, rule Tibet, he was a lay person, the Dalai Lama was still around. But the Dalai Lama was exiled from Lhasa for seven years when Polanyi was there. Now, Polanyi writes in his autobiography how painful it was, how he didn't want to do it. The Manchus really wanted him to do it. But basically, the Dalai Lama uh, uh, had to leave Lhasa. It's, it's a very long story. The Dalai, oh, the Dalai Lama's father uh, was involved in a plot, uh, a successful plot, but then it failed because everybody was arrested except for the Dalai Lama's father. But it was a plot which uh, led to the assassination of uh, Polonais' great comrade in arms who had uh, helped drive out the Jungars and establish this regime uh, in Tibet. So you have, right in the middle of the government of the Dalai Lamas, a secular ruler. Now, I have to add some caveats. When I say he's a secular ruler, I don't want to say he's anti-religious. He's a very religious person, as all Tibetans are. But here we have a, you know, in the, in the middle of this you know, rule by lamas, you have a secular person who is ruling. And his biography, from which I take this, his biography is massive. It's one of the great works of Tibetan literature. It's huge. Um, and it celebrates a secular person, not for his great visions and teachings of the Dharma, which is what you would expect in a Tibetan biography, but for his military prowess and courage and the awards and titles he gets from the Manchu Emperor. This is something which, again, I would say a sprout, if you will, of a kind of modernity. Now, the person who wrote his biography, and he picked him well, the person who wrote his biography was one of his followers, who was a great, great literati. And he wrote, this is in the 18th century, he wrote also what is considered to be Tibet's very first novel. And again, you know, questions of modernity, you know, the writing of novels, a secular biography, and then the, the author, he also wrote his own autobiography. And he was not a monk. Uh, again, you can say, well, what does this say about knowledge and awareness of the self in modern terms? Now, having said that, I don't want to say, oh, yes, well, then Tibet was modern. Um, no. Um, after Polanyi, his son took over from him, and his son was killed. Uh, uh, his son was killed by the Qing representatives, uh, and the uh, Tibetans were so outraged that they gathered outside the residence and burned it down and killed the representatives. The Manchus came in. Um, uh, it, it really was, uh, how should I say, it was the end of this sort of, uh, if I can call it an experiment. I think it was something which just happened by circumstances. But what I guess I'm saying is that, um, you know, in the sense of Tibet not being uh, disconnected, not being disconnected from the outside world, it's very interesting to look at this possibility of modernity. And I often like to think, what would, it, what would Tibet have been like had this continued? Um, but it didn't, again. Uh, we do have other examples during this period later. The uh, Doring Pandita, the one who went to the uh, uh, Qing court, uh, you know, the one who was uh, uh, wearing the different earrings. Actually, I, I don't have the whole passage there. The, uh, after he explains why he's wearing different earrings, the, uh, 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 the Qing officials then say, well, since you have one earring for the old emperors and one for Gu Shui Khan, uh, since you're now under us, maybe we should hang something on your nose. Um, and he, he has that in his uh, uh, biography too. But that also is a secular autobiography. And, well, so it's really a family biography, a lot about him, but also about his ancestors. But it's, again, it's, it's very, very huge. And these, this represents really kind of a new thing in many ways, the writing of secular biography and secular autobiography. So I guess what I'm saying is that um, it is a kind of thwarted uh, um, sprouts of modernity. Uh, but it's also indicative for me of the fact that Tibet was not isolated, separated from what was going on in the world. And uh, yeah, and finally the last, I guess one last thing. Um, in the early uh, 19th century, modernity is also spatial, the way we understand space. 
And in the beginning of the 19th century, I think it's 1820, you have the very first Tibetan, how should I say, uh, 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 real or realistic or semi-realistic Tibetan geography of the world, which is written in Tibetan by a Mongolian monk in Beijing who uh, learns from uh, uh, Kovalevsky, actually, Polish, but under the Russians, uh, 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 Orientalist. So there are a number of ways in which modernity uh, uh, can be said to intrude here. Okay, I'm going to stop here. Uh, I think you've suffered enough. Uh, so uh, I'm willing to take questions. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I didn't catch one thing. Uh, in the beginning, you were talking about who found and who bought. And you mentioned that there is one of the uh, ways that the bought theory can be disproved is with the who, which you cannot find in Tibetan. Yeah. Well, then you provided another example, which was, was the two or something else. And what's, what's up with the two then? Who then? Uh, uh, um, how did that get there? Wait, you mean how did the two get there? Yeah. You mean in the original Chinese? Right. It's an error. It's a mistake. Um, in other words, you have uh, this Tufa clan name. And so they refer to the area as Tufa. It's written down. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. All yeah. yeah. And so, and so the, you know, the, in other words, <laughs> Rather than taking Tufan as something that's absolutely correct, you know, let's go from that. No, it's a miswriting. And the, the thing is, and again, uh, you know, this is no great discovery by me. Paul Pelio wrote this in 1915. In fact, I have a little anecdote. I, 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 um, I will omit the names to protect the innocent. But uh, um, it was at a uh, meeting many, many years ago uh, of the International Association for Tibetan Studies. And a Chinese scholar, a good Chinese scholar, was giving a paper, and he kept, and he was giving it in English, and he kept mentioning the Tuhua Kingdom, the Tuhua Kingdom. And a very, very venerable Tibetologist, uh, who knew Chinese quite well, uh, was sitting next to me. And he turned to me and he whispered, he said, Will nobody take pity on the poor man and tell him that Paleo already showed in 1915, that this is impossible. <laughs> and uh, um, I, you know, also I very, you know, in a very low voice, I said, uh, "This has nothing to do with philology; it's politics." Yeah, but uh, if I can just add one thing, the interesting thing is, you know, it's basically a Western theory that was rejected and resuscitated in the People's Republic of China. Yeah. So, uh, Actually, it means bone hair or means hairless, doesn't it? Yeah. Do. So, isn't there a connection with the uh, with, uh, Tibetan uh, scenery of the mountains or just bone no, hair? No, and it's a non Tibetan clan name. It's, yeah. you know, it's non Tibetan. It's a transcription. You know, uh, uh, you know, it's a transcription of a name. And of course, they give it these characters which have this meaning, but. No, it, it, and again, it's localized. When we talk about this clan name, we're talking, they are in a very small area uh, to the east of the Kokomor. You know, and it certainly has nothing to do with central Tibet and with the Yarlung Valley where the name Pe really is. I mean, that's part of the problem too, that it's, it's not used across the plateau. There are all sorts of different people. We're talking about a, a period before the Tibeticization, if you will, of the plateau. Well, can you think in coincidence? Quite right. Excuse me? I was thinking that, that, uh, that it might be coincidence uh, or... You, know, you mean the meaning of the yeah. term? You know, it's hard to say. Uh, there's no explanation as to uh, the origin of that that I'm aware of. I could look further and see if there is as to how this became the clan name. But we're talking about that name, you know, during the period of the Xiambi. I mean, it, it would have to be really nothing to do with uh, subsequent Tibetan history.
Well, you know, you, you're, asking, you're asking me a political question. And, uh, 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 you know, it's, it's a really funny thing, and I said this. I should get my bona fides out there. I'm banned from China, okay? Uh, but not because of anything Tibetan. I'm banned from China because of uh, uh, my friendship with an Uyghur dissident who's now serving a life sentence. But um, uh, I'm also, and there's only a little bit there, but I'm also quite critical of the Tibetan administration in Dharamsala. Uh, and so if that's all I were doing, I would still be you know, allowed to go there. But um, you know, I've enjoyed being in China. And one of the things that uh, I, I find very interesting is that uh, in terms of academia, in terms of uh, 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 intellectual life, um, so much is translated into Chinese. And Chinese scholars, if you're in comparative literature or anthropology with certain limits, um, you'll find that some of the same questions that are discussed here, I mean, literature, uh, uh, you know, sociology, you know, they're also discussed in China very openly with all sorts of disagreements. When it comes to Tibet, it's like 60, 70 years ago. It's just too sensitive. So these things, um, Sometimes you'll speak to somebody, if you're speaking one-on-one, -on -one, yeah. they'll say, well, you know. But uh, if you're in a different area, you know, another area of intellectual life, you will find very lively discussions. And when you read it, you know, it really is, it, it, it's really interesting. But um, I think that they get tripped up by uh, the need to adhere to political orthodoxy with regard to Tibet. And if I may say so, the atmosphere, this is what other people tell me, uh, within Chinese the intellectual life is the atmosphere is getting to be a bit tense with uh, what's happened with Xi Jinping and uh, uh, crackdown. I, I, I mean, for instance, the, uh, you know, in many ways you would think that the, if, if things were wide open, this question of new Qing studies you know, might be debated openly pro and con with diverse opinions. You know, I'm always suspicious when everybody agrees. Uh, 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 you know, I'm not saying that the thing you know has to be wrong, but you know, you do have idiosyncratic colleagues, you know, who will take this position or that position. But everybody, uh, uh, you know, takes one position on things. I uh, I was a visiting scholar at uh, Beijing University in 2011, so I spent a number of months there, and they invited me to, and I don't know why they did, but they did invite me uh, to take part in a meeting in which they were discussing. And supposedly, I think there was like a five-year plan for this, so I haven't seen anything, but a new theory of, uh, uh, a new theory of uh, uh, nationality theory for Chinese history that incorporates the minority peoples. And it was very interesting, you know, sitting there, now this is in 2011, and one of the people there said, uh, and this is somebody, you know, of authority, I think, said that, uh, uh, for one thing, we have to beware of new gene studies. Absolute, and I said, absolutely not. And everybody knew what he was talking about. He said, this is very popular in the West, but we absolutely cannot, cannot fall prey to its, I mean, the, the uh, uh, implications, its evils. Then there was uh, uh, another interesting thing which was said there, that in the West, um, people say that national identity is fluid and changing. And so he said, that's okay for them. <laughs> for their identity is fine, not here. So, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, and now that, I mean, there's a reason for this. I don't want to say that, uh, uh, oh, you know, it's just because, uh, you know, China wants to dominate Tibet or whatever, but it really touches upon the way the Chinese state is constructed in the People's Republic of China, in which all of these peoples are, it's not that they uh, are just you know, willing to accept Chinese domination, no, they are Chinese. They are Chinese, and this has been for a long time you know, the idea that uh, uh, um, uh, people, misunderstand, they say people misunderstand the word Chinese, they think it only refers to the Han people. And, you know, again, you know, one of the problems with this, and here you have the use of language, such, you know, in a similar way to the way in which I said that the word ethnic group 
is now being forcibly used as uh, the translation of Nizu. Uh, 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 what was that? Um, I forget which term I was uh, thinking about now, before that. Chinese. Oh, oh yes, yes, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I mean, I think everybody knows that, uh, you know, when the Soviet Union was established, um, this, you know, the, the authorities decided to call the state not Russia, but the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. And it's a complete political term. It's a political term. It's not an, an ethnic term or an ethno uh, or uh, uh, ethno national term. Uh, um, whereas in the People's Republic of China, you know, clearly China, which is, you know, it's an ethno national term. And nobody has any doubt about that. I mean, I've never been with friends where we go to a Chinese restaurant and have to check to see if it's a Han Chinese restaurant or a Mongol Chinese restaurant or a Tibetan Chinese restaurant or, you know. You know, and um, as, as I sometimes say, if you have a Chinese English dictionary, you know, look, it, it usually says, you know, Han Yin Su Yin, in which Han translates as Chinese. Uh, but, uh, you know, things are being pushed, you know, along this way. Uh, the problem, as I say, is that these questions impinge upon the way in which the Chinese state has been constructed and is being taught. And so, one is not going to talk about the idea of national identity being fluid and changing, which, of course, it is. <laughs> okay, um, uh, well, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, there was a problem to ask. Okay. okay. Um, please, can we get the title uh, of your lecture? This, this paper. Oh, the, the, what? For example, uh, email. email. Yes. I can be filmed. Yes. So it will be available uh, somewhere online. Yeah. Once, once my agent uh, 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 makes agreement with the filmmakers and I get uh, paid sufficiently, then it will be available. Okay, well, thank you so much. I'm sorry that I have to run, but uh, you've been a wonderful audience. And uh, uh, I, again, this is a very pleasant introduction to Prague for me. So thank you so much.